Hello, in this video you'll be introduced to buckling. Buckling is the phenomenon that occurs when a relatively long and or slender member experiences axial compression loading. All the photos here show the occurrence of buckling. And in design, buckling equates to the failure of a member. Our very own Melbourne wheel suffered buckling failure due to unforeseen crackling in the structure in 2009 and had to be shut down. The load at which a member buckles or fails is defined by the Euler buckling formula, named after Leonard Euler, who first discovered there was a relationship between the compressive load a member could carry and its length. The formula here shows the road is inversely related to the member effective length squared, and for the time being will equate this to be equal to the actual member length. One can also see it's directly related to the material elastic or the Young's modulus, which you've already been introduced to, and defines the stiffness of the material. And it's also proportional here to the I value, or the second moment of area of the section. And so now I'll briefly introduce you to the second moment of area, sometimes referred to as the moment of inertia of a section. I is a geometrical property that describes the bending or the buckling stiffness of a cross-section. It's based on the cross-sectional area of a section. The cross-sectional area being the area exposed when you cut through a member perpendicular to its length. You'll learn how to calculate this geometric property for all types of cross-sectional areas later in the course. Now I would just like to consider the formulas as given here for a solid square and circular section and a hollow square and circular section. These formulas all have units of length to the power of 4. And one can see for the square section I is equal to the B value to the power of 4 and when the square is a hollow section it's equal to the outer B value to the power of 4 minus the inner B value to the power of 4 divided by 12. For a circular section, i is equal to pi times the radius to the power of 4 divided by 4. And when a circle is hollow, once again it's equal to the outer i value, take away the inner i value. Now a section has two possible axes about which it might buckle, the x and y axes. And these axes are 90 degrees apart. The buckle axis divides the region of the beam in compression from the region in tension. Over here, our member is buckling about its x-axis as the top half of our member is in compression. And to the right here, our member is buckling about its y-y-axis as, when looking at the deformed shape, the region in compression is to the right. All things being equal, a section will always buckle about its least stiff axis. Now I'd like to look at the Euler buckling formula in a little more detail. For a given section, our Young's modulus, second moment of area, would be constant and pi is always constant. And as you can see here now, our buckle load is inversely proportional to our length squared. And this curve plots as shown. When our length increases, our buckle load reduces dramatically. When using this formula, it's important to be clear about what units you're working in and to be consistent with your units. I suggest you work in units of newtons, millimetres and megapascal. If we present our Young's modulus in terms of megapascals, we would get a newton per millimetre squared. Our second moment of area, we said has units of length to the power of 4, so here would be millimetres to the power of 4. And our length would be in terms of millimetres squared, and thus cancelling everything out, our final value for our buckle load would be in terms of newtons. Let's do a quick example. We have a 1 metre long 10 millimetre radius solid steel rod. What is its compressive buckle capacity? The Young's modulus of steel is 200,000 megapascals. Calculating I now, we would substitute in for our radius, which would give us a value of 7854 millimetres to the fourth. Now calculating our buckle load, we would simply substitute in all our values, which would give us a 
final value for the load in terms of newtons because we've been working in millimetres to the fourth and megapascals and millimetres of 15,500 newtons or 15.5 kilonewtons. If one were to work out this buckle load for different lengths, this is the curve you would get and here you can see the value plotted at one metre. So when the member is longer than one metre through here, our compressive member strength is dramatically reduced. Up until now in our buckling formula, we have taken the effective length term as being equal to the actual member length. And this is not always the case. The effective length is defined as being equal to the distance between zero moment points or points of contraflexure or inflection. But more commonly, the effective length is quoted as being equal to KL, where K is the effective length factor and L the member length. And the value of K and the effective length itself is directly related to the member end restraints. Here are four common cases of different end restraint conditions. In A, we have both ends being pinned. In B, one end is fixed and the other is free. I call this the flagpole case. In case C, we have both ends as being fixed. And in case D, we have a fixed end and a pin end. And the resulting K values can be seen here as varying between 0.5 and 2. And I'll show you shortly how significant effect this has, but before I do so, I'd like to go back and show you where the K values come from. And to do so, I need to return to our initial definition of the effective length being equal to the distance between zero moment points or points of contraflexure or inflection based on the shape of the buckled curve. Let's look at three cases now and start off with our pin pin case. If we look at our buckle shape and we continue to draw our smooth curve, you can see here our points of inflection actually occur at the pin end supports and that's our effective length being equal to the distance between these points is equal to our actual length and thus k is equal to 1. Considering now our fixed free condition over here to the left, if you draw the buckled shape again, this time our points of inflection occur here and here and the distance between them now is equal to our effective length and that is equal to 2L. So this time round our buckling coefficient is equal to 2. Considering the case of both ends being fixed, if one draws the buckle shaped here you can see our points of inflection and this time our effective length being the distance between these points is equal to half the actual length. That's where our K is equal to 5 comes from. Thus another way I like to define the effective length is to consider it as being the distance over which you get a half sine curve when you look at the buckled shape. Returning now to a buckle equation, let's look at how significant these end restraints are. Here you can see four cases, pin pin, fixed fixed, fixed pinned and fixed free and the effective length shown here in the second row. Substituting these values into our formula now yields the following taking our pin pin case as being the datum, giving it a value of 1. In our fixed fixed condition, our column therefore has four times the buckle capacity of our pin pin case. Our fixed pinned column here has twice the buckle capacity of the pin pin case. And finally, when considering our fixed free case, the buckle capacity of this column is only a quarter the value of the pin pin case. That brings us to the end of this video. In the next video, I'll talk to you about the actual design of members experiencing compression loading. Thanks for watching.